Terry Beavers, better known as Missy, dedicated her life to helping others. She was a follower of God, a believer in charity and caring for those who couldn't care for themselves. She was the middle child having an older and younger brother who she loved deeply. She graduated from college with a bachelor's of science, but found herself out in the world and unsure of where she wanted to go and what she wanted to do. It was out there that she met Brandon, the man who would become her husband. Renewed by this love and driven to contribute as she always dreamed, Missy went back to school and received a teaching certificate, taking a job working as a special education instructor. Though she loved her job, the birth of her first daughter gave her a new purpose, and she chose to stay home and raise her child. As the years passed, she would have two more daughters and being a mother became a full-time job. As the children grew older, Missy began to feel that itch to help others, to go out into the world and to provide more. She became heavily involved in fitness and began working as a trainer for Camp Gladiator. To those she loved, Missy was a beacon of brightness, and now, to those she had yet to meet, she would become a guiding light to help them improve their lives through physical activity. She reveled in it, and she worked hard to give her all to everyone that she instructed. Missy was popular, a beautiful woman in great shape with a far-reaching social media presence. On the morning of April 18, 2016, Missy was scheduled to conduct a fitness class at Creekside Church in Midlothian, Texas. The weather report called for rain, but Missy was determined and posted on Facebook that the workout was going forward regardless of the weather. She went to bed early, her class was at 5 a.m., and she needed to arrive early to set up for it. She arrived at the church at 4.20 a.m., but what she didn't know is that someone was inside, waiting for her. At 5 a.m., when members of her class arrived, they found Missy unconscious and unresponsive. She was bleeding from multiple puncture wounds to the head and chest, the victim of a vicious and violent assault. EMTs arrived, but it was too late to save her, and police immediately began investigating. They were able to review the church's security cameras, and what they saw was as baffling as it was frustrating. At approximately 3.50 a.m., an unknown assailant had broken into the church by busting out the glass in a side door. The suspect was dressed in a complete SWAT gear getup, all black with a vest and a helmet. The bulk of the tactical gear combined with the helmet made identification impossible and even went so far as to conceal the probable gender of the suspect. All police were able to determine was that the killer had entered the church carrying a hammer or a mallet, broken several windows inside and opened various doors before moving in the direction of the entrance Missy Beavers would later use. The suspect appeared to have a foot or leg injury impeding his or her walk, and police believe that the walk suggests a female more than a male, but they cannot confirm this. Further investigation revealed a car in the area just hours before the crime was committed, but despite their pleas for information, neither the driver nor the car has ever been located. Police have never officially named a suspect, but plenty of persons of interest have been spoken to. In the course of their investigation, police found messages which they believe suggest infidelity in the marriage of Missy and Brandon Beavers, though whether or not this played a role in the murder remains unknown. A year later, and the case remains as confusing and tragic as it was the day Missy's body was discovered. Who would murder this beautiful, giving, and doting mother of three? Could it have been a jealous husband looking for revenge? Did her own father-in-law choose to stand up for a wrong he felt was committed against his son and things went too far? Was Missy a victim of circumstance who just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time? Was this a professional hit, paid for by someone who wanted revenge against Missy? Or did Missy fall victim to the wife of a man she may have been conducting a secret relationship with? This is Trace Evidence, Episode 25, The Murder of Terry Missy Beavers. Welcome to Trace Evidence. I'm your host, Stephen Pacheco. Today's episode examines the vicious murder of 45-year-old mother of three, Terry Missy Beavers. It's a case wrought with speculation and rumor, 
where the facts are few and far between. Despite surveillance footage of the killer, we know almost nothing about his or her identity or motives. Before moving into the case, just a few notes about the show. Trace Evidence is a weekly true crime podcast focused on missing persons and unsolved murders. We are available across multiple platforms and on iTunes, Google Play Music, Stitcher, and many more. Trace Evidence has a Patreon for those of you who wish to support the podcast. It can be found at patreon.com slash traceevidence. This podcast is a complete one-man operation, so if you enjoy it and wish to help support it, please check out the Patreon page. I've also set up a one-time PayPal donation link on the main website for those of you who wish to contribute but don't want to use Patreon. Links, information, and more items, including YouTube videos and full episode transcripts, can be found on the website at trace-evidence.com. If you'd like to contact me, you can email me at traceevidencepod at gmail.com, tweet me at traceevpod, that's T-R-A-C-E-E-V-P-O-D, add me on Instagram at traceevidencepod, or join the Facebook discussion group simply by searching for Trace Evidence Podcast or clicking the direct link on the website. If you have questions, comments, or case suggestions, I'd love to hear from you. As a final note, if you enjoy the show, please rate and review it on whatever app or platform you're listening on. The more ratings and reviews the show gets, the easier it becomes to find the podcast, and the more attention can be given to the cases that I cover. Also, at the end of today's episode, I'll be reading off October's Patreon donators, so make sure you listen out for that. Today I look into the murder of Missy Beavers. This is an absolutely confusing case with a slim supply of evidence and a heavy serving of rumor and speculation. I've been following reports of this case since almost the day it happened, and I'm no more able to understand the senselessness of this murder today than I was a year ago. This is episode 25. The Murder of Terry Missy Beavers Terry Missy Beavers was born on August 9, 1970 to parents James and Norma in Graham, Texas. Graham is a small city in north-central Texas and is the county seat of Young County. She was a middle child having an older brother named Clifford and a younger named Clint. Though born in Graham, she was raised in Jacksboro, a town even smaller than Graham. She was described as a friendly young woman who had no problem making friends, and in fact, she drew people to her with her fun-loving personality and captivating charisma. She's described as a selfless woman, wanting to help others, and her obituary states, quote, she never met a stranger and was willing to give everything she had to others, end quote. In 1988, she graduated from Jacksboro High School and attended several different colleges before finally finding her place at Tarleton State University, where she pursued a bachelor's degree of science, which she received in 1995. Missy toiled for a while after receiving her degree, unsure of her place in the world and the career she wished to pursue. She worked retail jobs for several years, and it was during this period that she met and fell in love with Brandon Beavers, who she would marry on June 20th, 1998. Her marriage to Brandon seemed to complement her life and gave her a renewed vigor for something more. She returned to school and received a teaching certificate in special education. She had always wanted to reach out and offer a hand to those who could use it, and her passion for the lives of others made her drive to help even more powerful. Missy taught for several years and reveled in her job. She loved feeling as though she was giving something back, and her students were like her children. On March 11, 2001, she gave birth to her first child, a daughter named Hannah, and it was at this time that she left her teaching position to raise Hannah. Though she loved her job, Missy felt it was more important that she be there to raise her daughter and considered it a likelihood that at some point in the future she'd go back to teaching. But for now, her place was at home. On March 7, 2003, Missy gave birth to a second daughter, Allie. Again, Missy felt her place was at home with the kids. Then on November 6, 2007, Missy gave birth to a third daughter who would be named Sarah. Missy was defined by friends and family 
as someone with a zest for life, a passion for God, and a dream of giving back to those she cared for and those who had less than she did. She was a big believer in self-motivation and that everything was possible if you really put your heart into it. According to her obituary, quote, she believed all things were possible if only you could dream big and believe in yourself with God's help. Missy lived out her life with great passion for family, friends, love, and laughter. She loved the ocean and the beach and could light up a room with her smile, end quote. Later in her life, Missy developed a strong passion for personal fitness and decided that she wanted to share it with the world as another method by which to help others achieve more and find confidence in themselves. She became a fitness trainer for Camp Gladiator, a national fitness movement that, at the time, was training in churches, parking lots, and football fields all around North Texas. Camp Gladiator defines itself as a fitness program designed to, quote, positively impact the physical fitness and ultimately the lives of as many people as possible, end quote. By 2016, Missy was 45 years old and living with her husband and three daughters in Red Oak, a large town south of Dallas and part of the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex. In conjunction with her work as a fitness trainer, Missy developed a large presence on social media networks. As part of her fitness program, Missy began hosting early morning classes at Creekside Church of Christ in Midlothian, Texas. The classes began at 5 a.m., and Missy typically arrived 30 to 45 minutes early in order to prep for the class. On the night of April 17, 2016, Missy read a weather report that called for rain the next day. Despite the weather, Missy was determined to host the class as always and went online posting, quote, if it's raining, we're still training, end quote. This was posted to Facebook where Missy had hundreds of friends, but typically left her posts open to the public for all to see. She later posted that she was going to bed since she had to be up at 3.30 a.m. At approximately 5.06 a.m. on April 18, 2016, the first of two 911 calls came in. The call described Missy Beavers having been found inside the church, unresponsive and obviously a victim of an attack. When EMTs arrived on the scene, they found broken glass and other signs which indicated that someone had broken into the church that morning. The EMTs found Missy deceased upon their arrival, and later examination would show that Missy had been murdered and suffered multiple puncture wounds to the head and chest. They also saw signs on Missy's body that she had obviously fought and struggled with her attacker. Police arrived on the scene moments later and found evidence of forced entry into the church, spoke with EMTs, and immediately began conducting a homicide investigation. According to the investigators, the perpetrator had used a pry bar to smash out a window in a side door of the church. Police were tight-lipped about whether or not the murder weapon was recovered from the scene. Strangely, when asked whether or not they had found the weapon, a police spokesman responded, quote, It's a vital piece of information that we want to protect until we have an opportunity to confront the killer with it. End quote. At first, police believed they were dealing with a theft gone wrong. Their initial theory was that someone had broken into the church with the intent of stealing and had stumbled across Missy in the process of the robbery and murdered her as a result of this. They did not believe homicide was the intent of the perpetrator, but things would quickly change. The church itself had a system of surveillance cameras, and very quickly police began reviewing the footage. The images that they found were not only shocking, but would lead to a great deal of speculation. Using the footage, they were able to map out a timeline of events that took place during the morning Missy Beavers was murdered. According to the official timeline, at 3.50 a.m. on April 18th, an unknown assailant was captured on surveillance footage breaking into the church. This suspect was dressed in a complete mock police SWAT team officer's gear. Black boots, black pants, a black riot-style helmet, black gloves, a black top, and a black vest which said police on the back. This person was wearing tactical gear and carrying a hammer or mallet with which he or she had broken a window in order to gain entrance to the building. The gear that the suspect wore made it impossible for authorities to determine a gender, and the only real clue that could possibly lead to identification was the way in which the perpetrator moved, described as a walking style which seemed to indicate some kind of an injury to the right leg or foot. 
The suspect, throughout the video, seems to lean against or push against walls in an attempt to maintain balance or relieve pressure from the injury. Further analysis suggests that the suspect stood between 5 foot 2 inches and 5 foot 7 inches tall. The suspect walks down a dimly lit hallway, dragging his or her right hand along the wall. In another shot, the suspect is seen opening a door and stepping out of frame. At the point in which the suspect opens the door, there's a clear shot of some kind of blunt weapon in the right hand. A few moments later, the suspect approaches a locked door. At this point, the individual produces some tools from within the tactical gear and attempts to force the door open, but is unsuccessful. The suspect opens another door, steps into the door frame, but then turns and continues back down the hallway. At this point, the suspect begins walking back towards the camera and swings the hammer at a few more windows along the way. Strangely, while the suspect will open unlocked doors and attempt to unlock doors which are sealed, he or she never enters the rooms, just whips the doors open, takes a look, and then continues on down the hallway. The suspect wanders aimlessly at times, and at no point displays any sense of confusion about location or nervousness about being caught or interrupted. This has led many to believe that the suspect may have been familiar with this environment, possibly having been there before or having studied it in the past. Another odd detail of the video is that, when the assailant breaks windows, he or she doesn't swing the hammer with a large force or violence, but rather unenthusiastically thrusts the hammer in the direction of the glass. For the next 30 minutes, the suspect wanders very casually around the church, entering the frame of surveillance cameras here and there, and continuing on his or her way, seeming mostly disinterested in the environment. At 4.20 a.m., Missy Beavers arrived at the church to begin setting up for her class. The suspect is seen on camera just minutes before her arrival, though would disappear off camera in the moments before Missy herself stepped inside. Whether or not footage exists which shows the confrontation between Missy and the suspect hasn't been made clear, though police fairly rapidly release several clips to the public which show the suspect, in hopes that someone might be able to identify the individual. There was footage which showed a vehicle in the area, a light-colored Nissan Altima, with a distinctive sticker or emblem on the back bumper, though they were unable to make it out clearly. A still frame of the vehicle was released, the driver of this vehicle has never been located and has not come forward to talk with police. Initially, Police released a statement about the suspect, referring to the perpetrator as him, but they later retracted that specification of gender, explaining that the more they look at it, the less sure they are that they are dealing with a male. In their statement, police said, quote, We're backing off of our statement that the suspect on video was a man. I know we said he over and over again, and that was a mistake. There's a lot of speculation based on the gait and appearance that this person may be a woman. It's a legitimate question now. We no longer say the suspect is a man. That does not mean I am saying that the suspect is a woman. It's just at this point, we can't rule it out. We don't know yet." End quote. Police were questioning gender due to several factors, predominantly due to the fact that the gear conceals the body so strongly, but also due to the suspect's movements. Midlothian police would state that in, quote, Certain portions of the footage, the suspect appears to have what has been described as a feminine sway or walk. The footage also indicates that the suspect has a distinct walk that is indicative of some type of injury which affects the right leg or foot." End quote. Whether or not the suspect suffered from a foot injury is unknown, though others have gone on to speculate that the movements may seem to suggest an injury because the suspect may have been wearing boots that were either too large or too small in hopes of throwing off clues about his or her identity. Rather quickly after watching the footage, police ruled out the possibility of theft as a motive. Later inspection of the property found, as police had theorized, no items were missing and there were no indications that any kind of theft had been conducted. Investigators begin to theorize that the suspect broke into the church, not with the intent to rob, but specifically to be there waiting for Missy and that murder was the ultimate motive. During their investigation, police went just a few miles down the road to SWFA Outdoors, a sporting goods store. Surveillance footage for the store showed a vehicle similar to the Nissan that they had previously released a photo of. In the footage, the Nissan drives slowly through the parking lot. At one point it stops, 
the lights turn off, and the vehicle sits for several moments before the lights come back on and the vehicle exits the parking lot. This footage was shot just a few hours prior to the murder, and though investigators believe that it could be linked to the murder, they have no evidence to say so officially. Police are eager to speak with the driver in hopes that he or she may have seen something that morning which could help identify the killer. Baffled by the crime and the method by which it was conducted, the police called in assistance from the FBI as well as the Texas Rangers. There was a special dog brought in from the ATF in order to sweep through the church searching for evidence of gunshot residue. Brandon arrived at police headquarters two days after the crime, having had to come back into town. He was off on a long-planned fishing trip in Mississippi and arrived with his brother, Chad. The two arrived to speak with police and to make arrangements about recovering Missy's truck from the church parking lot where she had left it. Brandon later said of his wife, quote, She was a great woman and a great wife, a great friend, and she will be missed by many people. End quote. Police were then stuck in a position where they were trying to determine whether or not Missy knew her attacker or if this was an instance of a random attack. Though evidence seemed to suggest that, at a minimum, the perpetrator likely entered the church and was waiting to attack, they were unsure if this person was waiting for Missy or someone else, and Missy just happened to arrive first. Friends and family, however, felt very distinctly that whoever had committed the crime knew Missy and had targeted her specifically. Brandon, Missy's husband, later stated to People Magazine, quote, I still think whoever this person was knew my wife and had a motive. There's no doubt about it." End quote. He would later state in another interview, quote, I've pretty much exhausted every scenario and every avenue that I can think of who could have done this. End quote. G.M. Cox, an associate professor at Tarleton State where Missy went to school, is a former police chief. When asked about the suspect, he responded, quote, There has to be some link between her death and people in her past. This person intended to do exactly what they did, when they did it, and whom they did it to." End quote. In hopes of finding a suspect or any leading information, police began digging into Missy's life as well as the lives of her family. They scoured over her social media and began making connections which they considered to be of interest. In discussion with a friend of Missy's, police were informed that just days before her murder, she had received a message on LinkedIn from someone who she didn't know. Missy is alleged to have shown this message to the friend, which she described as creepy, though this friend was unable to recall the name of the man who had sent the message. Police later found another set of messages Missy had exchanged with someone that authorities would only call a person of interest. They defined these messages from both Missy and the unidentified male as, quote, flirtatious and familiar, end quote. Police obtained warrants in order to gather information from the cell phones of several members of Missy's family. Among those whose records were checked was Missy's husband, Brandon. Police alleged that text messages exchanged between Brandon and Missy suggest that the two were experiencing financial difficulties, as well as having discussions about extramarital affairs. Police also sought and obtained warrants to gather cell tower data, as they believed it was possible that Missy may have been in contact with her killer and that the killer may have checked social media to ensure that she would be arriving at the church that morning. When the information became public about possible infidelity in the marriage, many in the public began to look at Brandon as a potential suspect. Brandon's mother, Marshall Tucker, when asked about the alleged flirtatious messages stated, quote, I mean, as bad as it is on the girls, especially the older ones, for Brandon to lose his wife to murder and then find out about the flirtatious remarks to other people has got to be devastating to him." End quote. A slew of online investigators went so far as to not only accuse Brandon of involvement, but even his father, Randy Beavers. Many speculated that Randy had a distinctive walking style which they view as similar to that of the suspect seen in the footage. Brandon and his father have vehemently denied any involvement in this crime, and have made pleas through the media for junior investigators to leave this up to the authorities. The family has stated that all of the discussions online only bring pain to them, and that Brandon is trying hard to protect his young daughters from all of the baseless accusations hurled against him. According to authorities, throughout their investigation, they were able to verify alibis for both Brandon and Randy. At the time of the murder, 
Brandon was in Mississippi on a fishing trip while Randy was traveling in California. Police would later state, quote, neither Brandon nor his father is suspected of killing Missy, end quote. Christy Stout, Missy's sister-in-law, released the following statement on Facebook in regard to accusations hurled at her family. Quote, All you Facebook detectives out there, I'm sure, haven't checked with American Airlines to verify they were on the planes headed there. Nor did any of you check with the phone companies to see that Randy Beaver's phones were actually pinging in the San Diego area at the time of the murder. After all, that's why we have the FBI and law enforcement who confirm that already because armchair detectives just don't have that ability. Not only that, but the FBI drove to Biloxi, Mississippi to confirm with others on the fishing trip that Brandon was in fact there at the time of the murder, as well as verified pings from cell phone towers that he was there. For those of you who say Brandon hired someone to do this, again, the FBI has thoroughly watched and studied his accounts and have seen no large money being moved around. Brandon has been bugged by the FBI, grilled like you would never fathom, and his story has never changed. If I could sit you all down in a room with a marker board and show you what we've learned about this case and how much work people have been involved." End quote. Randy was looked at suspiciously beyond his walking form. Four days after Missy was murdered, Randy Beavers dropped off a blood-soaked woman's white double XL long sleeve shirt to the Dry Clean Super King in Midlothian, Texas. The dry cleaner said that the shirt had clearly been previously washed in an attempt to get the blood out. Randy alleged that the blood on the shirt came from a dog who was involved in a fight with another dog. Police obtained a warrant and took possession of the shirt in order to conduct a DNA analysis. They also spoke with Beaver's veterinarian, who confirmed that he had brought in an injured dog. The lab tested the blood on the shirt and were able to confirm that it was not human blood. If the police believe that Brandon and Randy weren't involved and have tight alibis, then why do others continue to dig into them? First and foremost, people consider it a possibility that Brandon, though he may have been out of town during the crime, may know the name of the person who killed his wife. Many have suggested that revenge for an alleged affair may have been the motive for Brandon to have wanted his wife dead. Interestingly, online detectives did not just look at the family. In a showing of resourcefulness, however misplaced, they came up with two other suspects that they believed could be connected. One was a man who had attended Missy's fitness classes and who happened to have a wife who was short, had a stocky build, and was suffering from a broken foot. It has been suggested that investigators did look into this possibility, but quickly ruled it out. Another name which has been bandied about online is that of April Sandoval. She had won a few free classes with Camp Gladiator and was struggling to lose weight after having a child. Though she only attended four out of five classes, she did end up being captured in a photograph with the group, which included Missy. That photo led many to begin investigating her. The evidence they alleged could point Sandoval to the crime was all circumstantial. She had injured her foot at work. She was height-wise in the range. She had been arrested for passing a bad check and had dropped out of the military. They also claimed that Sandoval was paying rent on a Nissan Altima, much like the one caught on video that morning, though it would later be proven that the Altima belonged to her mother, and Sandoval has stated that she never drove it. Police later spoke with Sandoval after receiving many tips from online researchers, but found nothing which they felt connected her to the case. Throughout the investigation, in the months and weeks that followed, there was never anyone who was officially listed as a suspect. There were persons of interest, but no suspects. Midlothian Police Chief Kevin Johnson said, quote, in general, I can say with dozens of specific persons of interest that were called in that we ran them through a variety of filters, which included their potential connection to the victims or church. Obviously, their alibi at the time of the offense, their height, weight, background, and then with most of them, there were face-to-face -face interviews." End quote. Despite frustration with a lack of answers, the family has been very supportive of the Midlothian police making multiple statements about how cooperative they've been, how hard they've worked, and how every time they reach out with a thought, the police themselves have already had the thought and investigated it. With no officially named suspects, with no real leads, with nothing that appears to show why Missy Beavers was murdered, it remains a startling and tragic mystery. 
But one would expect in a case like this that the theories are not in short supply. They come from all manner of sources, from the police themselves, the family, friends, and a slew of online investigators who believe they have the answers that could crack open this case. The first theory is that Missy Beaver's murder was unmotivated because it was not planned. Many have speculated that the person who committed this atrocious crime was not there with that intent, but instead to vandalize the church itself. They point to the fact that the assailant arrived early in the morning when no one was there and broke into the church. The assailant then spent 30 minutes walking around, breaking into rooms and shattering windows. Many believe the suspect intended to damage the church and did not expect Missy Beavers to arrive when she did. This theory also splits off into another. The second theory suggests that the person who murdered Missy Beavers did in fact have murder as a motive, but that Missy was not the target. Who the target could have been, none can really speculate. Perhaps a regular churchgoer, perhaps a member of Missy's class, maybe someone entirely different. Either way, this theory suggests that when Missy arrived, the suspect became startled and felt the only way out was to kill her to conceal his or her identity. That suggests that Missy Beaver's death was more of a case of being in the wrong place at the wrong time, though many disagree with this theory. Another theory is that Missy was in fact the target, though it becomes a question whether the suspect elected to commit this crime or was hired or asked to do it. If indeed the suspect committed the crime out of a personal desire or motive, this would suggest a link between Missy and her killer. The crime itself was brutal, conducted in close combat, and certainly seems to suggest a personal vendetta or link between Missy and the person who stole her life from her. It all becomes a question of why. This is where many have tried to make connections to people who have interacted with Missy, even if only once or twice, and we get accusations, like the ones against April Sandoval. The fourth theory is that the suspect was sent there by someone else who wanted Missy dead. The list is both long and short, with no name truly being known, and only some suggested. Some believe that Brandon Beavers hired someone to kill his wife while he was out of town with an ironclad alibi. While family reacted as though they were surprised about Missy's alleged infidelity, investigators found evidence to suggest that Brandon and Missy had discussed it, leading many to believe that Brandon planned out the murder, possibly even longer than he'd been planning his trip to Mississippi. Though it's completely speculative, this is one of the more popular theories. The next theory, which connects somewhat to Brandon, is that Missy was murdered by her own father-in-law, Randy Beavers. Whether this was done by the request of his son or out of his own anger, no one can really decide. Truly, the only pieces of evidence, and I use the words evidence loosely, which implies any connection between Randy and Missy's death is that Randy has somewhat of a similar walk to the person in the surveillance footage. That's it. No hard evidence or details of the investigation place him at the scene, and in fact, he was known to be out of the state at the time the murder took place. Still. This doesn't stop people from continuing to list him as a person of interest. The final theory is that Missy Beavers was not murdered by someone she knew, but by someone who knew of her. This theory suggests that it was in fact a woman who murdered Missy that April morning in 2016 for one of the oldest motives in the book, jealousy. Investigators were aware that Missy was talking to someone in what they called a flirtatious manner. It's been alleged that this man was married, and that it's entirely possible that his wife chose to murder Missy in order to avenge the infidelity of her husband. Despite the fact that investigators looked into this closely and were unable to make any true connections to others, many still believe there's a high likelihood that the murder of Missy Beavers is directly connected to her love life. Over a year has gone by, and yet no real answers have been found. Without a suspect, it becomes a convoluted mess of speculation and rumor. A beautiful woman, a mother of three, a wife, a sister, a daughter was murdered and so little has been uncovered. A family has been shattered by a senseless crime with no apparent resolution in sight. Police received thousands of tips in the first two months of the investigation 
and spent over $400,000 in man hours and resources to look into this murder. Authorities continue to receive tips on a weekly basis and are frustrated that this case has remained a mystery for over a year now. Missy's family desperately wants answers as to why she was murdered and who did it. They want justice for the brilliant life that was stolen away and the broken family left behind so that they can move forward without their wife and mother, but possibly have closure. Wouldn't it be great if there was a place to discover awesome discounts on gently used clothes? There is. Swap.com. Swap.com is the world's largest online consignment and thrift store. With Swap.com, you can save up to 90% off retail prices on your favorite brands like Lululemon, Carter's, Nike, J. Crew, and Gap. Between 6 to 10,000 new items added daily. If something doesn't fit, enjoy hassle free returns within 30 days, no questions asked. I have a special offer for all Trace Evidence listeners. Using the promo code TRACE40, you will receive a 40% off store-wide discount for your first order, and free shipping is included. This offer is valid now through November 30th. Visit swap.com, and don't forget to use your promo code TRACE40 for some amazing deals. The murder of Missy Beavers is a disturbing and brutal crime made worse by the incredibly baffling nature of it. You have a 45-year-old mother of three who's dedicated her life to helping others, be it as a special education teacher or a fitness trainer. Everyone who knew her spoke volumes about her kind nature and how giving she was, the kind of woman who would give you the shirt off her back if she knew you needed it more than she did that day. In the aftermath of her murder, her family has been tested not only by having to accept such a grisly crime, but by being the subject of ridicule and speculation from the outside world who know little of their lives and leap to conclusions based on circumstantial, or in many cases, incorrect information or assumptions. It was my intent with this episode to lay out as much of the factual evidence that exists and to give all of the details that I could find. In much of this case, though, it can be difficult to maneuver because so many people's ideas and opinions have been tainted by rumor, so I had to work twice as hard as I normally would to ensure that I was reading fact and not someone's theory. I wanted to address a few things about this case before moving into the theories. The first thing is the surveillance video from inside the church that night. I'm going to share this video with you on Facebook and Twitter, but it's truly bizarre. I tried not to go too in-depth in my description of it because, frankly, you have to see it to understand. My immediate question was, where does someone get this kind of gear without it being traceable? I know in this day and age you can go and find a wild assortment of things online, but to see someone dressed up in mock SWAT gear, I can't help but think that it likely wasn't purchased all in one shot, and there has to be some way of tracking it down. In addition to that, I can't help but wonder if the killer isn't still in possession of the gear. And when I say mock SWAT gear, I don't mean bad looking. It's actually very convincing, at least from the standpoint of the surveillance camera. I think when Missy ran into this person at 4 in the morning inside of the church, there was likely a lack of concern and a feeling of ease at first. This may have been all that was necessary to allow the perpetrator to get Missy's guard down enough to be able to attack her. The video itself is odd, and I've watched it likely more times than a person should. There's certainly something strange about the movement style of the killer, though I can't say with certainty that I agree with the concept of the so-called feminine sway. There does appear to be something bothering the individual, though, and I understand why authorities believe there may be an injury to the foot or leg. What is most frustrating about the video is how casual the killer appears to be. The suspect isn't rushed or hurried. At no point do they act alarmed or concerned. It's certainly not the behavior of someone who has broken into a church and is worried about getting caught. And if indeed the murder was the motive for the break-in, this person is exceedingly calm and collected about it, which is absolutely chilling. The last thing I wanted to spend a moment on before moving into the theories is how important it is when investigating a case like this 
to consider the things you're saying. I discuss theories. I try to examine what has been put out there and give you some facts one way or the other about it. In most cases, I do not tell you what happened because these are all unsolved cases and there's no way to know for sure. So I tell you what I consider unlikely versus what I consider likely. You're never going to hear me say, this is exactly what happened, because I don't know and nobody does. It's important to remember that the subjects of these episodes are real people with families and friends who have been left broken in their absence. It's remarkably insensitive and selfish, I believe, to construct a theory with little basis for evidence and pass it off as fact. I do reach out to people involved in these cases, but even if I believe in my heart that someone was responsible, I'm not going to make that accusation. I might ask, but I will not state it like it's fact. In this case, many people dug into the lives of those close to Missy and those who they believe knew more than they were saying. They gave out addresses, made accusations, damaged lives, and brought pain to the family and specifically Missy's children. I know how passionate we can get about it, but we have to use our best judgment. If I believe I know the answers, I'm going to talk to the Midlothian police, not go online, expose a random person on a hunch, and act as though I've got all the answers. The police always hold back information. There are details we don't know, then there are angles we can't see. All of this must be considered when looking at any unsolved case. So now let's move into the theories. The first theory looks at this case from the angle that Missy's murder was a matter of being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Proponents of this theory believe that the suspect broke into the church not with the intention of murdering Missy, but for some other reason. Initially, it was believed that it may have been a case of robbery gone wrong, that Missy may have surprised the assailant and was attacked as a result. Even police thought that at first, but fairly quickly were able to change their minds about it. Mostly based on the fact that, throughout the entire surveillance video, you do not see the perpetrator take anything, and when the church was investigated, it was found nothing was missing. Though I can understand the rationale behind this theory, there doesn't appear to be any evidence to support it. It's extremely difficult to say, though. You can watch the suspect walking up and down the halls, opening doors and breaking windows. It seems like exceedingly strange behavior if indeed your intent was to murder someone who's going to arrive later. Why run the risk of someone hearing the glass break? And why break into the church to wait for Missy if you were going to be wearing head-to-toe fake police gear? The suspect could have just as easily walked up to Missy in the parking lot, caught her off guard with the outfit, disarmed her with a few words, and then attacked without needing to be inside of the building. And if you were going to break in, why not hide somewhere and wait for your target to arrive if that was the purpose? Though there's no way of knowing for sure, I do believe that the attack wasn't random. I do believe that the murder was a motive. I do believe that whoever committed this crime intended to do so. But then the question becomes, was Missy definitely the target? The second theory speculates that the murder was the reason this person broke into the church that day, but we can't know for certain that Missy was the intended target. It seems likely, considering that there was a class that morning and Missy had spoken about it on social media. It certainly wasn't a secret, and if someone truly wanted to attack her at a time when she would least expect it, this would line up well with that intent. But what if the killer didn't even know Missy? What if he or she had entered the church looking to attack someone else? The perpetrator shows a certain level of comfort and familiarity with the building, walking around as though they'd been there before. In addition to this, perhaps the breaking out of the windows had more to do with a problem he or she had with the church and someone who belonged to it more than a woman who was going to be conducting a fitness class that morning. The police getup is interesting, because what better way to throw someone off and buy yourself enough trust and confusion to get close? There likely was a way for this person to get out without committing the murder. He or she could have hidden when Missy arrived and snuck out. They could have run out the door they came in when they heard Missy coming in the front. They didn't. They went towards the main entrance. They waited for someone to get in. The one thing which leads me to believe that this murder was not conducted on Missy by mere happenstance, and that Missy herself was likely the target, is the timing. No one else was in the church at that time. The only person coming into the church before 5 a.m. that day was going to be Missy. You'd have to assume that if someone were plotting against a church member or someone else who could be entering the building, 
They'd have watched long enough and paid enough attention to know when that person would arrive. The suspect broke in at 3.50 in the morning. They waited for someone to get there. I believe that someone was Missy, though we may never know for sure. The third theory adopts the concept that Missy was the intended target, but questions whether this was a personal crime or merely a matter of someone being hired or talked into committing it. There's currently no way for us to know this answer with 100% certainty, so all possibilities have to be considered. If indeed this was a case where someone was sent to murder Missy, obviously all of our questions at that point would turn to motive. Why would someone want Missy dead? That question opens up a rather large bag for which we cannot truly find a resolution. While I can accept the idea that this was a murder-for-hire situation, there are a few things about it that lead me to question it. Missy was found with puncture wounds in her head and chest. A professional, or someone who wants to ensure a kill, is likely going to use a gun and not a stabbing weapon. Perhaps this is why the ATF brought in gunpowder residue-sniffing dogs. The church is somewhat isolated, and for a crime that's going to take place at approximately 4.20 in the morning, I don't think the killer is going to be worried about being heard. In addition to this, the use of the hammer to break the window seems unlike something someone would do if they were specifically there to murder someone on the orders of someone else. Perhaps the windows were broken and doors were opened to give the appearance of a robbery gone wrong to throw off investigators, but that's purely speculative. Theory 4 continues on this line of thought, though it looks more closely at the likely names of individuals who may have wanted to hire someone to murder Missy. We don't know who could have been hired for this, and it's certainly not like the movies where there's an underground network of highly trained assassins to turn to. There are suspicions, though they are based on mostly speculation and conjecture. Was it a jealous husband who felt betrayed? A father-in-law who was angry about alleged infidelity against his son? the wife of another man who wanted revenge, or someone who had developed an interest in Missy and felt spurned by her. Remember, if someone was hired to commit this crime by someone who knew Missy, that's yet another mouth that has to remain closed. Typically in situations like this, the more people know, the harder it is to keep it under wraps. When it comes down to the most theorized suspects, the possibilities are endless. I don't think this was a case of murder for hire, though. The weapon is what clinches it for me. This was a murder conducted in close combat. Missy was savagely attacked and likely was face to face with her killer when it happened. To me, that's much more of a sign of a personal motive than of a cold and detached killer for hire. The police outfit, I also believe, was worn not only to surprise Missy, but to conceal the suspect's identity from security cameras that he or she knew were there. I believe that the suspect knew the church, knew the cameras, and believe that if he or she didn't conceal his identity, people in that community would have been able to identify him or her. So is the murder-for-hire theory possible? Absolutely. But to me, it's not nearly as likely as this being motivated by personal issues and anger towards the victim. The fifth theory takes a much closer look at a possible suspect. Someone who was close to Missy, who would have known her routine and may have had motive to murder her. The first suspect on many people's lists is Missy's father-in-law, Randy Beavers. We know that during the course of the investigation, police were able to uncover information which they believe suggests infidelity at most, or flirtation at least, on Missy's part. There are allegedly messages exchanged between Missy and another man on LinkedIn, which is just an odd site to flirt on, but regardless, many have run with this information. According to this theory, Brandon Beavers spoke to his father about the issue, and Randy either elected to take action of his own volition, or Brandon suggested some kind of action be taken. You must bear in mind that this theory is extremely speculative, and there's no solid evidentiary basis for it other than rumor. Initially, Randy was looked at by police due to his bringing a blood-soaked shirt to the dry cleaners four days after the murder. It was a woman's shirt, which I found fascinating, considering police have stated that they believe the movement style of the suspect was feminine. As it turns out, the blood on the shirt was not from a human, and Randy had a solid story about his dog getting into a fight and being injured, which the veterinarian was able to back up. On top of that, Randy wasn't in town when the murder was committed. He was in California, and independent sources were able to verify this. So why is Randy considered a suspect? Essentially because people watched the surveillance video and felt that in footage they'd seen of Randy, that he moved in a similar style to the killer. 
It's a fairly thin theory when you really look at it, and while I can understand the feeling that this crime was committed by someone who knew Missy, I just don't see the real connections to Randy here. It's possible that Randy has knowledge, or played a role, but as of yet, I've not seen a single shred of evidence that leads me to believe that. There are those who believe that Missy's husband Brandon played a role in the murder, either by hiring someone to commit the crime or by being more directly involved. The FBI did investigate this possibility and wasn't able to find anything. Much like in the case of his father, there doesn't appear to be any evidence to link him to the crime. The husband is almost always the first and prime suspect when a crime like this is committed, but the police have never listed him as a suspect. He was out of town, fishing in Mississippi when his wife was brutally murdered. Many people have speculated that it's highly coincidental that both Brandon and his father were in different states when the crime was committed. And though I understand that viewpoint, you also have to look at the other side of the coin. If you were plotting a murder, what better time than when you know the husband will not be in town? Much like the case of Randy, there's never been any solid evidence, and frankly there's never been any thin evidence either, which connects Brandon to this crime. Plenty of people can see motive in the discussion of infidelity, but you can see motive in many places. It only matters if you've got the facts and the evidence to make real connections, and when it comes to Brandon, there's nothing that connects here. The final theory is that Missy was murdered by someone who knew her, but who she did not know, at least directly. We know about the alleged infidelity, though to what extent it went, we can't be sure. Suffice it to say, the messages that were exchanged between Missy and the unidentified man on LinkedIn have been the source of a great deal of speculation in the year since Missy was killed. Some have looked at this as a likely place for a motive and considered the possibility that a jealous wife or girlfriend chose to murder Missy as retribution. There's certainly a possibility there, and if indeed the suspect moved in a feminine way, this would make sense. It's hard to say because my logical mind tells me that this isn't the kind of thing worth murdering a person over, but when it comes to romance, logic isn't typically something people are able to get a proper hold of. So it has to be looked at. I certainly think it's possible that Missy was murdered over some kind of a love triangle situation, and that the personal nature of the crime itself would fit this scenario. The problem for me is that the police spoke to the man Missy had been flirting with. I would have to believe they thoroughly examined anyone connected to him, especially if he was married or dating. That doesn't mean they could necessarily find the evidence, but the name of the man has never been leaked, let alone a possible suspect he was involved with. Of course, we don't know if there was another man somewhere else that Missy had spoken with which could have sparked someone to commit this heinous crime, but I certainly believe this is a good possibility. When it comes down to it, I believe Missy was targeted specifically and by someone who at a minimum knew her well enough to hold a grudge or anger towards her. Who this person is is open to debate, and though this is purely my speculation, I wouldn't be surprised if at some point in the future this case gets solved and it's found that the killer is someone who had, or still is, living in that community. Terry Missy Beavers was murdered over a year ago, and despite their dedication to the case and devotion to the process, authorities have been unable to produce a suspect. They, like many of us, are baffled by the surveillance video, and at the time, they believed they would be able to solve the case quickly. Unfortunately, it has drawn out, and has become only more complex with each passing day. Thousands of tips have been run down, hundreds of individuals have been spoken to, search warrants have been executed, and yet it has all led back to square one. Who murdered Missy Beavers, robbed her three daughters of their mother, robbed Brandon of his wife? Who would commit such a terribly tragic crime and just walk away into nothingness? Perhaps someday we'll have an answer, and Missy's family can be granted the justice and closure they so desperately deserve and need. If you're interested in finding more information about the murder of Missy Beavers, there are plenty of news articles and websites which address the case. Just be careful how much you believe what you're reading. If you have information about the murder of Missy Beavers, please contact the FBI or the Midlothian Police Department. What do you believe happened to Missy Beavers? Tweet me at TraceEvPod, email me at TraceEvidencePod at gmail.com, or comment in the Facebook group. 
If you'd like to support Trace Evidence, please visit the Patreon page located at patreon.com slash trace evidence. It's time for me to do my monthly shout out to new patrons from the month of October. A special thank you to Christy Hole, Ken Osborne, Kenda Harrison, Linda Cardinal, Carol, Bernadette McLaren, Leslie Kearley, Sinead Donnery, and Emma. Huge apology to anyone whose name I may have butchered, but I think I did all right this month. You guys help make this podcast better, and I'm indebted to you for your support. For those of you who are in the tier to receive stickers, I'll be mailing them out this week. Thank you again for your generosity and support of the podcast. I want to thank you for listening to this episode of Trace Evidence, and invite you to check out our website at trace-evidence.com. You can find links to the Patreon, social media accounts, as well as places to go to download the podcast and subscribe. I'm always eager to hear your feedback. If you enjoyed this episode, please give us a good rating on iTunes and leave us a review. This will greatly help our reach and bring more attention to the cases I cover. Thank you for listening, and I hope you'll join me next week for another unsolved case on the next episode of Trace Evidence.